dealing with right here, right? We're continuing with this, but we're going to show this vid one more time. Uh-huh. This exposed um, DVD right here that is on the false, um, the false teachers and is speaking of the so-called pseudo-prosperity gospel, right? And we're touching on this. So we're continuing with the teach on um, tithing. Now, first of all, let's continue with what we've been stating and saying about tithing. Tithing, like so many other things that we have uh, scripturally in the Bible, are Israel, are commanded to Israel. As we mentioned on this particular DVD right here, that you probably can see on the YouTubes and find out there, that... Um, uh, there's so much to this right here, too. I won't let it so much to this. Just, I, I'm trying to present some of the basic points. And one is, take a note of this, is one, that tithing was not commanded to the Gentiles. So when we say no tithing, no tithing till the promised land, that no tithe, because if we are keeping it in the spirit and the truth of the word, then we recognize First of all, who tithing have been given to? Because if you ask these, these tithing people, are you Israelites? They might try to say, well, we are spiritual Israelites. And here's another interesting thing. Remember, we often like to refer to the Schofield, right? The Schofield Reference Bible. And if you go to the back of the Schofield Reference Bible, there's a section that's called um, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. Let's just see if we can show you a close-up of, of this section right here, right? Schofield reference, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? There's a section at the back of the book, right? And now, in this particular section that's contained at the back of the book, it speaks on the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. Now, there's much to this. And I would advise those who want to get to the root of this particular subject matter because it will explain a lot of things that are often blurred and confused. And it's because of that confusion, because of that illiteracy in the Bible, that failure, not just to be able to read it, but to read it from a studied point of view. They, they're reading the Bible, but they're still reading the Bible as novices. So the preacher says, the pastor says, go to this verse or that verse, read such and such, and he goes through a song and a dance, so forth and so on. People, they fall for it. And, and what's so dangerous about it, I mean, from, from so many different points of view. First of all, we look at the spiritual point of view. It's a lie. You understand? That means the people are not being free. They're being taken into captivity. They're being taken into slavery. And this is why you have ones like... Um, uh, T.D. Jakes, who basically has some AIDS ministry or whatnot, but he said there's nothing he can do, nothing that the church or his church can do about AIDS. He's saying that there's no scripture on AIDS in the Bible. There's, 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 Paul didn't leave anything. I mean, when you, when you see the interview, the, the, this clip and this interview, you might be able to find it out there on the Internet, but when you see this interview here, you, you might have to stop it for a moment and... and I, I I don't know. I don't know what you I don't know what your reaction is gonna be. But remember, um the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. You know what I mean? So keeping that as a meditation, you have to recognize that we even our feelings, thoughts, emotions in Christ must be in yoke with him. You understand? He says, Don't be troubled by these things. Even though they're very troubling things, you know saying we gotta trust in him and ask him to to, to to open our eyes, open our minds, let's overstand, let's overcome, protect us, you know, from this evil generation forever. If you look at it on the psychological level, this is why you have, oh, man, the, the whole confused psyche of black people. Black people's situation has not been improving only. The only improvement people can say is so-called so financially speaking or economically speaking. But the more... Black life, so-called, in America has been improving. Like, the more blacks get money and get rich, you understand, the worse the people become. 
It's like we've gone so far from what we one time said that black people wouldn't do this or wouldn't do that. In fact, even in that time, black people were more Israelitish. Up to the time of um, what they call it again, the Civil Rights Amendment. Because the Civil Rights Amendment, it was a whole new world order. You understand? From the time of the Civil Rights Amendment, it was a whole new kind of a whole new psychology. Now materially on body, look what's happening in, in the church. There is this rise in AIDS and in sexually transmitted diseases and death, there's stress, there's anxiety, there's also the perversions going on right in the black community. Among black people, things that one time we would have said and we would have been correct at that time, saying that black, black people, when we heard about somebody doing something, somebody, this time we could say, well, you know, that's not a black person. You understand? You, you felt sure that it wasn't a black person. Usually it was not a black person. Now you can't be so sure. There's sometimes when we hear the news and you know how they, they must know it too because they don't say black right out sometime or African American or whatever. They just say what happened. And then you, you think, oh, that must be a white person, you know, and then you see it's a black person. So what has happened? Now, we're in the book of Numbers, right? Mm-hmm. And in the book of Numbers, we haven't got enough to this portion of the book of Numbers. And this is our study. This is the, the, the basic discipleship study um, text right here, the Midbar. And we're about to put out the fifth portion of the book so that the whole set, you understand, all five books will be there. And it's from, a, it's from our namesake, the so-called European Jews. But in principle... It's very studied and can help us catch up, mm -hmm. help us basically understand. But we have our Ethiopic documents, our Ethiopic texts, like, like the, the Octatech, you know what I'm saying? We have the Octatech and the Ethiopic Torah, so we can fact check it with our own, our own indigenous 2,600-year Judaism. Yes. We as Beit Israel, as Ethiopian Hebrews, we have at least, even based on the Ethiopian, Beit Israel of the East, the Falashes of the East. We are the Falashes of the West, but from our brothers over there, even the testimony there is at least 2,600 years. Think about that for a moment. 2,600 years. That's like two millennia and 600 years. So if we project back in time, Two millennia ago and 600 years ago, roughly, that would be roughly about 600 or so. You understand? And really, it's older than that, according to our Ethiopic sources, we say over 3,000 years, which connects us directly to the stream of the Bible. So are there black Gentiles? Well, yeah, there are black Gentiles. You understand? Um, if we look at Africa, you understand, Ethiopia one time was a Hebrew-ruled nation. The revolution against his imperial majesty, what it was, you can basically say, was the non-Hebrews ousting the Hebraic, the proper, authorized, God-given Hebraic government or the imperial government. So are we in favor of restoring the monarchy? But of course, you understand, but there must be a base. You see the base of Israel, the elect Rastafari, are a base for the monarchy. We're not just looking only at Ethiopia on the map. We're looking at all of Africa because Rastafari brings that true spirit of the King of Kings and his Christ to all of our African people as well as to the righteous Gentiles. And the righteous Gentiles, they also speak about the white Rasta, the Asian Rasta. They have work to do. You know what I'm saying? But we have to recognize what does the scriptures teach. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of confusion. And confusion is a lack of fusion. And Tawahido speaks to fusion. You know what I'm saying? Bring it together. That means first is, is, is our individual personal responsibility. Are we in the teaching of his man? Do we know the teaching? Do we just know it? It's not even asking ourselves whether we fully agree on it and we're going to act on it or we're able to act on it right now. But do we even have the knowledge? You see, that's why Christ said, ye shall what? Know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. He didn't even say that. That's so. It's so much dependent on what we do, 
but it's first of all depend on our knowledge because our knowledge, what we know in, in true faith, will direct right action. You know what I'm saying? But in ignorance, you see, but in ignorance, we continue to fall down the rabbit hole proverbially. You understand? It's like the bottomless pit. You understand? Like we said, how much worse can it get? You know, was, and every day it seems to people say, well, this is the worst thing I've seen. And it's almost like you feel stupid even saying that. You say, this is just another bad thing I've seen. You know, I have to come to that point. So the first thing is that tithes, the, what's called the tithes, is an Israelitish institution. There is no Gentile nation that the tithes speak towards. In fact, as we read on here um, in this particular um, section right here, as we read on, let's get the, the Crudens. We're in the Crudens, an old copy of the Crudens Concordance. You might be able to find it on, on, on the, the, the Google or whatnot. It's a pretty big book and stuff like that. But if you, this is what we invest in. Because once we get in the right mind, the right person, a whole world of possibilities and opportunities open up to us. You understand? And then we really recognize why Christ said, even in those days, rejoice. Lift your heads up. You understand? So, the first thing we touched on was Abraham, briefly. Abraham, Genesis 14, 20. And the second place we touched on was Jacob, Genesis 28 and 22. And the preacher that we talked about on this particular exposed DVD, and I, I, I'm sorry I don't remember the Gentile brother's name, the black Gentile brother's name. He's my brother because he's in Christ and because he taught a good message. When he said that him and his people are Gentiles, I almost got a little bit upset to hear it. But then the Holy Spirit said to me that why are you, that's what they declare, that that's all they're able to receive as Gentiles. Is how they live even in that Gentile status relationship with Christ. You understand? To whom more is given, more is required. So if we say we are Beta Israel, and we are true elect Rastafari or Ethiopian Hebrews, then for us Hebrews, more is required. All right, so let's get this knowledge right right here. So, so in um, Genesis 28 and 22, we have Jacob. Yet he made a very interesting point. I, I could tell he studies the Bible, and that's always, I mean, it's, I don't really meet so many black, it seems like, regular black folks who are Christians and stuff, who really study this Bible, and if you challenge them with something in the Bible, they're going to go do their homework, instead of just saying, well, I don't know, I don't care, I guess so, whatever, like that. You'd be like, what? You know, wow. You know, didn't Christ say, you should know the truth? They say, yeah, that's right, well... I, what I know is, oh, my goodness. So what they're saying is that it might be true, it might not be true. So he made a good point about Jacob. He said that nowhere do you find Jacob ever fulfilling the vow he made. And if you read it carefully, Genesis 28 and 22, Jacob's vow was actually fulfilled. You understand? was actually fulfilled when they came into the land. When they finally come into the land during the time of Yeshua or Joshua, right, that's when they fulfill that vow. So that vow really that he made was in, it was in his loins, that generation that was to be born. Because the place, it was Bethel where he put the howlet. Some say an obelisk. Some say that it was just a stone. The, the English say the stone skion. Um, perhaps, maybe, maybe not, if it connects to the black nobility, probably it has something to do with that, because those were black Hebrews and the true benign Barit, you understand? But however it was, he laid it in a place called Bethel, or Beit El, Bethel, Bethel, you would know it. And Beth means house, or Beit means house, and El means God, so that was the simplest, the basic church, in spirit, that was the Israelite, we can say, church, so to speak, Bethel, or the house of El, the house of God. Now, when they finally erected, you know, erected the tabernacle and other things and sent it, it was right there, you'll find, as you study it through. So you'll see that Jacob never paid tithes, because so who would he pay tithes to? He said that he will give a tenth if he returns to his what? His father's house and to his people. 
You understand? So, so some things with the tithes are also prophetic. And remember, the tithes is just like if you have a agent, and he says, I'm going to help your career out, so forth and so on. And you're going to make a lot, but I just want 10% of it. That's what the tithes in that sense was. Not so much to God, you understand, but in the name of God to his priest, to those who perform his priestical function, and that was the Levites. So if anyone, you understand, according to that clear-cut law, would receive of the tithes, even in kingdom, it must be to those of the tribe of Judah, of Yehuda, according to the book or the, or the epistle of Hebrews to the Hebrews. Now notice, the epistle to the Hebrews, which we consider as Rastafari in this society of his majesty, we consider Hebrews as our Kedase. The book of Hebrews is our liturgy, is our Kedase. Because that message to the Hebrews, it explains to the Hebrews who are in the Moshiach, where they stand and how they stand in Christos. This does not mean that the other epistles, which was to other Christians and or other believers, other faithful, because some of the groups were mixed. Some of them were they had they had Hebrews and they had Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles, blacks and whites, so forth and so on. Similar in the sense to what we have today when we, when we take a look at it. So, being that that this is to give you a little bit of background there, but now. This is, this is before, nearly 400 or so years before the Orit or Torah, before the law was, was, was given, what we call the Mosaic, what we call here the Mosaic Covenant. Now, under the law or under Orit or Torah, Moses had ordained. Moses, he's the one who who, in a sense, reenacted that, he ordained it, he put it into effect. He, he, kone, hone, kone, kahine, he, he made it be. He made it be and it became. In other words, to say ordained it. Leviticus 27 and 30, Leviticus 27 and 31 and verse 32. So we have, when we go to tithes, and we get to the, 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 the foundation of it. The first time mentioned, we have to Melchizedek. Edek. Now, the Gedla Adam that we've published, it kind of goes into a little bit more detail on Melchizedek. And for those who might be interested in studying more up on that, um, the, Gedla, the Gedla Adam, we're, 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 hopefully y'all will and will, do a do a vid because it's a couple of interesting subject matters that connect with this present the present um um matter and teaching that's being reasonable i can't even give a name to it because there's some aspects i can name but then you see that this is leading to other connections because he, he he is he, he is untying all of these knots these things that we didn't really understand fully yovas now Leviticus is the second, well, Leviticus is, so we have three areas. We have Genesis, Genesis 14, 20, Abraham. We have Genesis 28 and 22, Yaakov. Then we have Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 to 32. Now, all the tithe, which was a tenth, it was a tenth portion. It's like you have ten sheep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It come under the rod. You understand that tenth one is the Lord. So if you have a hundred sheep, you understand basically what would be a tenth? It'd be like ten sheep. You understand ten sheep you will give to the Lord by the hand of the Lewawiyon or the Levites. In other words, now here it teaches us that the tithe of the land. It was a tithe of the land. Now. I don't want to go into much detail on this, but some of y'all are familiar and, and others who, who are not, this will be a, another subject if they're willing to go into this particular, um, you know, this particular, you could say, a, a, a subset of it. Some Christians interpret that, well, when we come into um, Christ, when we're born again, some Christians, some pastors, some of the preachers will try to say, well, to that argument, even though we Gentile, there's no Jew or Gentile, so forth and so on, so we can't actually take of that. But then if you ask them, do you keep the Sabbath? 
they would say, well, the Sabbath is a Sunday, and then when you show them the scripture, you, you know, you get a lot of confusion. So it's clear that the prosperity preachers take that, that the, the tithes out of its proper context while still admitting to be Gentiles. And clearly the text speaking to Israel. This is why we, we pointed out right here in the Schofield, at the back of the Schofield by C.I. Schofield, it has a, uh, a section called Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. You might be able to find it maybe even on the Internet and, and read up on it and study up on it, um, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth by C dot i dot schofield s c o f i e l d and it touches on firstly the jew the gentile and the church of god and it's a very at first when i read it it kind of it, re, it rebuked a lot of things that i had heard and even some things that i was inclined to believe that you know you hear from other folks talking about christ bible and that sound nice and you'd be like yeah that sound good you know what I'm saying? And if you're not doing due diligence, if you're not diligent like the Bereans, you're not going to pick up on that. So where is that in the Bible? Can you show me that? Or what not? Well, what you say that it's talking about, take your note and look for it and see if it's there or not if somebody's not making up stuff, willingly or unwillingly, however it is. But there's a contrast between Israel and the church. There, there, there's certain contrast. There's a different calling between Israel and the church. Now, some folks would say, um, would dismiss it, but it's very, very important that you get it. And we can see why these prosperity preachers, they don't really go into that, those sort of areas. They give you a song and a dance and appeal to emotion and give you some, some paid actors and everything or, or other people who, who are just like paid actors because they're basically, you know, telling you that they have to, um, pay God for a blessing, which is a contradiction to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 20. You understand? The gift of God cannot be bought. The gifts of God cannot be bought on that particular level. So um, it cannot be bought with money. You know, that's just a foundational verse. So sometimes they'll, they'll spin it on you, and they'll say, well, it can't be bought with money, but he says it here in his word. You know, it's, it, it, it's a game, but whoever doesn't want to receive it, you understand, that means some people like being played. You know, some people like playing, some people like being played. Remind me of the Sweet Dreams song, Sweet Dreams Are Made of These, who am I to disagree? Some of them want to be used, some of them want to be abused, some of them want to abuse you, some of them want to be abused, you know. So, you know, like the Bible even clearly tells us in, um, in, in, in the Revelation, he who want to be holy, let him be holy still. And he who want to be filthy, let him be filthy still. You know, like, so each one, even in that, at that late stage of the book, is telling us that it is about choice. Many are called, few are chosen. You know, many hear about something, a few you know, have the faith and act on it. Others just hear about it and say, that sounds good, and, you know, it's, it's just a, a kind of a head thing because there's no heart, like, incentive behind it. But this particular article, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth, is very, very important. You understand? There's some other articles here, too. But this one, at first when I read it, in fact, I got to actually check it out again, actually go over it again, because what we're finding more in our Torah studies is that some things that we hear um, – so-called Christians talking about are actually meant for Israel. In fact, as it, let's just go through this through this um this note here on tithing right here. So some Christian oh I didn't make the finish make the point about some Christians what they do is this they say that um, you are spiritual Israel. So when you are born again, you're entering into the spiritual land, like a spiritual land, like Jesus land in a sense. So you have to tithe of what you make every week. Like, I, I, I had to ask a couple of preachers, I said, wait, if there are two harvests in Israel, according to the Bible, according to the Word, right? There are two harvests, right? So the, the usual time, how did one's tithe? The Bible clearly describes how the tithes were made at what seasons and what time. There were gifts. There were offerings to the priests, because the priests, in a sense, didn't have um, their own inheritance. 
but they did have control of certain lands and ones working on certain lands in a similar way that the Ethiopic or the Ethiopian church was previously, you understand, on, on a certain level. So it's not as though they didn't have their own resources, but people did give gifts. You understand, they did, they, did, they did bring gifts, they did bring free will offerings and different kind of offerings as they willed. It wasn't like they were told, the, the time they were told to give tithes was very limited. It wasn't like people give a tenth of their salary every week, you know, like with the church. And then you begin to see the nefariousness of it when you start to hear ones like T.D. Jake saying that Paul didn't leave anything in the Bible on, on AIDS. So it's hard for us to teach on it. There's nothing that the church can do with it. I mean, it's amazing, but that shows that ones are not dealing with, what about healing? What about prayer? What about, but, but, I mean, not better yet, but or better yet on the personal responsibility. What about preaching morality? You understand? And, uh, you know, what about telling the people about their, about their bad living, their unhealthy living? You understand, whether it's what they eat, whether it is how they think, you understand, whether it's how they relate to God, dealing with their full tripartite being, their spirit, their soul, and the body. No, what they're after is like one brother said in the, in, in the, on this particular disc here, he said um, they're like the pharmaceutical company. <laughs> I thought that was a very, it was a very good point, but it was a very astute observation. Because when you really look at it, it's almost like the pharmaceutical company. They tell you all these things, but then they tell you quickly, like, it may cause this, it may cause that. So when it backfire on you, they say, well, you're not believing hard enough, or you're not giving as much. So what the church has learned, and you know where the, where the, where the church gets this tithing thing from? Of all places. It gets it from the, Ro the Roman Catholic Church. They actually get this. It's when the Roman Catholic Church, around the 3rd or the 4th century, they wanted to raise some monies. And we learned this also in the, I think this also probably connects with indulgences. They wanted to, like, build some cathedrals and do some, you know, like, you know how they, these, these Romanists, how they like to live in the lap of luxury and stuff like that while claiming to be simple people of God. It's not their wealth. It's, quote, God's wealth. And then they show you a white boy up there who we learn actually is the son of one of the popes, uh, Cesare, Cesare uh, Borgia, this guy. So what you see is that these guys, right, these guys, right, worship these guys. And you wonder why they don't have no love for the people. These guys right here, they raise about 800 and, no, no, sorry, 460 billion, between 420 to 460. I might be mixing up the, the two and the six. So between 420 to $460 million. Guys like this too right here, your Creflo, you know what I'm saying, your Creflo dollar, right? They raise the money for these guys right here. So it's very interesting, and this is one reason why they, they, they dress like this. They, 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 you know, they dress in the European, you know what I'm saying, in the European tradition because they learned everything from their God, you understand, from, from their false God, you understand, their false idols. So it should not shock us. It's almost like they transform themselves just like the Catholic Church did. They do the same thing. They find something in Old Testament law that refers to and that is under the jurisdiction of the Beta Israel. And Israel's a whole nation. We know the difference between Rome and Israel, don't we? Now, and I'm, imagine how shocking this is. Rome, even Pontius Pilate, remember the crucifixion scene where Pontius Pilate said, you know, these Jewish kind of things about keeping the Sabbath and all this kind of stuff, it's not my problem, man. You know, why are you bringing this to me? So forth and so on. And it's interesting because the Romans, they didn't want a business with your really religion, only they wanted you to serve them and the Pax Romana, to, you know, to, to give them the tithes and give them, so you give them their portion, more than, is more than a tithe that they wanted and everything. Then the Roman Empire, then all of a sudden, under Constantine, and Constantine is like Esau, spiritually speaking, the contrast, you understand, you know, is there. He sees the, 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 the symbol, which is a sword, 
And then they would then later on now appropriate the legal jurisdiction, because law, remember, it's law. They will appropriate the legal jurisdiction from the, the scripture. Now, one will say, did some churches tithe? Well, you have people who tithe who were Israelites, such as the Ethiopian Hebrews, and many of them, when they accepted the Moshiach, Jesus Christos, and became part of that Falash and Mora group, so forth and so on. Um, of course, they, they understood this tradition because this tradition and this custom, they had land. You see, they, they grew produce of their crops. You understand? They had animals, livestock. It was not money. You understand? Remember what, you remember what um, Yeshua said? He said, give to Caesar that which is Caesar. You understand? And the purpose of the tithe was not so that folks pay off their bills, in that sense, or their bills, their bowling. The tithes were not for bowling. So now you over that, that they give their tithes, not for the true purposes, not for even what ones would call some real charitable things. Of course, many of them say they go to Africa, and you know what they do? They spend less than $1,000 building a, a one-room, a one-room building, and then call like they built a, a whole church or a big thing. You, you, on paper, it looks, they cook the books, in other words. So we hear about these things like, wow, they're really making moves. You understand? And then when it comes down, they're doing the, the mere pittance, but they're claiming this off as a lot of money, and then they're taking the money to do these scandalous things that they be doing in Jesus' name. But it's in this Jesus. It's in Bar Jesus' name. You understand? It's not in Yeshua HaMoshiach's name. You understand? And it's not in his, his, his spirit, you know? But um, so they play that little thing about we spiritual Israel, and when you come into Jesus' land, you understand? Every week when you work and you get your pay, you bring 10% to, you bring 10 to us. Now think about this. The Israelites... They had about two major harvests. You find it in the Bible, the, 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 the former and the latter harvest, they call it, right? The former and the latter rain or for the former and the latter harvest, right? And um, it tells us specifically the times that they did it. So I was wondering, with some of these, these, these churches and so forth and so on, these black churches, like, are you supposed to give it every week or just when your harvest come in? Is it your income? Because remember, remember what kind of society we're living in. We're not living where we don't have no land. We don't, we're not producing nothing on the land. We don't have no livestock, no cattle. So it's not in even the spiritual keeping with this word because they don't even believe or accept that they are beta Israel. They don't accept that they are lost sheep of the house of Israel. They're Israelites. They say we are Gentiles. So how are they misappropriating this verse, this reminds me of the, the arraignment psalm, Psalm 50. You understand? Where God judges them, where he arraigns Israel. You understand? When they saw a thief, you understand? A thief like this, this, this uh, uh, Cesare, Cesare Borgia, they did what? They consented with this thief. You understand? And this is where you see the consent. And many of y'all and many others consent in ignorance with these same thieves. And yet all you're doing is furthering the destruction of your own so-called black people, your so-called black people. Think about it, 420 to $460 billion with a B? And where, where does the money go? What happens to this? What is this? Come on, even the big mega churches, they, that didn't cost 400 and and that didn't even cost a billion. Really? Where does this go to? Yo, it's, 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 you know, but remember, see, part of it is just being foolish, like the Lord says, being foolish. You understand? Being hard headed. Don't want to hear your word. Don't have no time to study and learn these things. And don't even have true faith that even if you know these things are true, people still go along knowing what they know. They continue to do what they do. So I just say like Morpheus. Morpheus said it best. Morpheus in The Matrix, he said, these people are like um, so like inert. They're so helplessly 
uh, dependent upon the system that they were even, they're not ready to be unplugged. You know what I'm saying? They're not ready to be unplugged. But for those who are ready to be unplugged, listen up. Here's the unplugging. So all the tithes of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's, is Adonis. It is kedus. It is holy to Adoni. It is holy to Yahweh. Baruchu. Blessed be He. There were three sorts of tithes to be paid from the people, besides those from the Levites to the priests. Notice that you had three kind of three kinds of sorts of tithes that were paid from the people. That were paid. Remember what a tithe is. You understand? Know Remember, it says it says the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree. Remember, these were ordinances and ways of living that was given to them as they were going through the wilderness experience, like we're going through a wilderness experience. Elijah Muhammad, the honorable Elijah Muhammad, said, "We are in the wilderness with this great people, so we're going through this wilderness experience. We should be learning and preparing. That's why no tithes till the promised land. It even gives us something to look forward to and to work towards. So it gives us the option to learn these things, and it doesn't say that." One should not be a cheerful giver. But see, that depends really more on, <laughs> more on faith. That basically shows you that all these guys that use all these curses and these hoax and these games to hoodwink and bamboozle ignorant and illiterate um, lost sheep who think they're Gentiles, you know what I mean? You know, hoodwink and bamboozle them. I mean, these, these, these niggas, you know what I'm saying? These, these niggas. You know, these niggas. But let's go on. So the Levites, too, also paid tithes. The Levites also paid tithes, right, to the priests. Now, also in, in Numbers, um, it goes, it breaks down. It breaks down, actually, the different sorts of priests. When we talk about order, a county, organization, all these numbers, it's starting to break down how they were, they were, uh, uh, you say, a movement. They were an organized. You understand? They were an organization. So it's pointing to organization. You understand? Organization. So we have Numbers 28, verses 26 and 27. Now, I want you to hear these, these, these portions of it. Firstly, there were, Levi, there were times to be paid to the Levites for their maintenance. So there were times that were to be paid to the Levites for their regular upkeep, for their maintenance, right? And for Numbers 18, 21 to 24. Secondly, there were tithes for the Lord's feast and sacrifices, which were to be what? Eaten in the place where the Lord Adoni should choose to put his name there, to wit, where the ark should be, the tabernacle or the temple, the taps of where the Lord's name is, in, in other words, to, wit, to witness and the connection, i.e., is where the Ark of the Covenant, the Tabot, is. Now, what does that mean to I and I in this present time? You understand? What does that mean as Israel? See, as Israel, we've got to think, as Gentiles, we can just say, well, is there any um, symbolic uh, Christological thing in it. If not directly, then we can just keep moving on. But as Beta Israel, we have to look at this. You see, because we're looking to come out of Babylon. These people don't even know that they're in, in Babylon. The people being hoodwinked and bamboozled by this, they think they're living in the Garden of Eden. You know, they think they're living in um, um, paradise or, 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 you know, some, some kind of fantasy, some, some dream. I don't know what they're dreaming right now. But it says, for the Lord's feast. So there were tithes that was firstly for the Levites. You see, because the Levites, you understand, the priests, those who really were doing the work. You know, now we said no tithes to the promised land. Let's just clarify this. There are those who do have land, even over here. You understand? And say if it's, I use this kind of likeness, if I'm, I, and I was in the Caribbean, for, for example. 
and Manaman have a piece of land. It's not the promised land, but, you know, we all eat. You understand? So, because I and I deal with the work of the King of Kings in his name, Kedamawi Haile Selassie, you understand? And that spiritual tabo or tabernacle, you understand, Manaman, you know, bring, bring true the, the, a, a tithe, a portion. It's not literally a tithe, but it's a, it's a free will offering. It's a gift. You see, the key word for us is gift. But now, tithes are particularly connected with the land. You see, because that, that which we are to tithe, you understand, is of and concerning the land. So, it's not as though, when, when you hear these preachers and pastors talk about, well, they need to say that they need to talk about tithes and preach on tithes all day, all night, every occasion they can, because people are not tithing enough, they need more money. But we can clearly see what they do with this. That, that it's not even in the spirit of the word. You know what I'm saying? We can see clearly what they do with it. So there are tithes, you understand, for the Levites, for their maintenance. And then there are tithes for the Lord's feasts and sacrifices to be eaten in the place where Yahweh would choose to put his name. Now, this tenth part was either sent, remember this tenth part had to be sent to Jerusalem, Jerusalem. so this is why we say that they were not tithing. They were giving gifts, they were offering, so forth, but they could not tithe until they got the land. So we recognize how important tithes is then we should recognize even more so how important it is to reclaim I and I land. You understand? And to get prepared and to get our boots, in other words, on the ground. You understand? But we can't do it in ignorance. We already see that we can't do nothing without Yeshua, without Jesus Christ, without his word, the true faith of his imperial majesty, the true teaching of his imperial majesty. All right? Now, that tenth part was either sent to Jerusalem in kind, or it, was, or it was too far, or if it was too far, they sent the value in money. Now, here money comes in. People say, oh, you see, they sent the value in money. Money. So tired of money. Give money. Like you see these prosperity pimps doing. But check this out. Which was to be laid out, laid out, not like they do in those prosperity pimped out churches, but they're laid out for oxen, for oxes. You know oxes? You know oxtail for the whole thing. Sheep, wine, right? Or what else they pleased, or what else they pleased. So that tends to have been for kind of boshim, beshim, you understand? Besom, you know? It could have been for the besom of the kana. Deuteronomy 14 Verses 22, verse 23, verse 24, etc., 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 was that terrestrial. So thirdly, beside these two, so we already got the two types. The first was for the Levites, for their maintenance, and then it was for the Lord's feast and the festivals. All right? If one was too far, they could send it in money. You understand? They could send it in money, and when it reached there, then it will be converted you see where we saw the money changes go in, in the Bible? See, in the New Testament, we read about the money changes. Most people don't figure out why they would have money changes there. Because people were sending it by money and now it had to be converted over, you understand, in order to be utilized within the holy precincts. But beside these two, there was to be every third year, every third year, every third year where? In the land. Every third year right, a tithe for the poor. So in addition to the priest, remember the priest, the Levites, Lewawion, which in Hadith Kidan time and New Covenant time, among we as Beta Israel, that is Moa and Bessa Zaim Negeda Yehuda, that is the line of the tribe of Judah, that is Judah, is very clear from Hebrews, that's the evidence, the documentation there. So we have the Levites in principle, but in prophecy Judah, you understand? Or the true Rastafari church and ministry. Then, secondly, right? Then, secondly, we have for the feast and the holy festivals. For the particular feast and holy festivals, right? Then, thirdly, we have every, every third year a tithe 
for the poor. A tithe for the poor. Now, have you ever heard of any of these, any of these really caring anything about the poor? Either of them? I mean, they're both the same thing. You would say, oh, that guy's black. Uh, stop judging by appearance. You understand? Judge by spirit. It's the same deception. If you can't see it, you understand, then pray. Ask God to open your eyes. You understand? It's the same deception. Have you ever heard any of them talking about, okay, this is the third year, and we need a tithe right now for the poor folks, the ones living in the projects, all those people who, you know, all those people out there that we're trying to reach. And I know it sounds like a joke because they don't say those sort of things. The majority of them don't. Maybe a few do. And and hallelujah for them. Um, there was to be a tithe for the poor to be eaten in their own dwellings. In the same chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 28 and 29. So we have three kind of tithes. Right? We have the tithe for the Levites for their maintenance. Because they had no inheritance in Israel. There was to be a tithe for the Lord's feast and festivals, the seven, the seven major holy feasts that occur during the three Moedim or at the three um, pilgrimage festival seasons. All right? And then lastly but not leastly, there was to be every third year a tithe for the poor, the poor and the needy to be eaten. See, the whole thing about the tithe was to be eaten. You know, it's amazing because you hear Negroes, uh, I mean, you know, black folks, let's say it like that. You hear black folks talk about, I going to eat, got to eat, yo. Yo, I got to eat, man. Yo, man, you know, I got had to eat, you know, for, you know, to eat. You know, everything to eat, right? And then you look at this, you're like, see, John knew exactly who he was talking to. He was talking to us, and he has a, to eat. The tithe was to eat, not for somebody to be talking about, look how rich I am, look at the kind of watch I got on, oh, look at my uh, $16,000 dog. <laughs> so, wow, anyway, oh, man, uh-huh, the wrath, the wrath, the wrath, right? So, there was a, people forget about that third one. They forget about that third tithe, that third tithe every what? every three years. And that's not the only thing there in the Torah for us as Beta Israel for the poor. In fact, there are more things in Torah for the poor than there are in your so-called society programs, nonprofits, all that kind of stuff. You understand? In the New Testament, remember, all that was Old Testament now. The Luke, because I've been saying, well, that's Old Testament. What about the New Testament? New Testament and tithes, right? Because you be hearing all these people saying, we're not in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. Okay, in the New Testament, let's, let's, let, let, you know, let's get these verses on tithes. Let's, let's hit it up now, right? It says, in the New Testament, neither our Savior nor his apostles have commanded anything in this affair of tithes. Wow. You would have thought that our Lord, in other words, Yeshua HaMashiach, or who they call Jesus Christ, or the apostles, um, I just know about Peter, Paul, Mary thing, but, you know, the real apostles, all of them. You understand? Um, don't want to start naming a few, but you know who the apostles are. You understand? Oh, how about, like, Hawaii Apollos, Paul. How about James? Surely James says something. We have something, how about in the book of Hebrews? People say, but in the book of Hebrews, but then that takes you, that's speaking to the Hebrews. Notice the only book in the New Testament that specifically speaks on any kind of thing concerning tithes, really, is Hebrews. It's Hebrews. There's no commandment where Jesus says, and thou shalt pay the tithes. In fact, what Christ does say to the, to the Pharisees is like, you know, the good thing you'll do is that you'll do tithe, um, mint and cumin and anise, and, you know, those are, those are herbs and spices. You'll do tithe these herbs and spices. You understand? Um, 
but the weightier matters, the real issues of the law like righteousness and justice and truth, you know what I mean, those kind of, you know, those righteousness issues, you know, defending the, the poor and the needy and the, and, and the fatherless, you know, and the widow and, you know, the, 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 the so-called poor against the rich and so those things you don't even deal with. And it's interesting because we have the same thing going on today with, with uh, prosperity, um, so-called black churches. You understand? Where there's so many issues, that kind of a 400 plus billion dollar kind of, um, I can't call it income, but take. Let's call it a take. With that much take, that much cake, can you imagine? That's, rob that's what John means, that they robbed him. You understand? They rob because then when it turns around to, say, Africa, look what they're doing up in Africa. Now, of course, there are some preachers and Christians, not, not to condemn all Christians. In fact, we're just focusing on those nigger preachers. You understand? On these kind of nigger preachers. You understand? Just like, you know, we would tell a Gentile, you know, white Rasta or Asian Rasta, if you, if you know the truth of Rastafari, then you have a ministry among your people. You understand? To, to, to bring them to that same light and reality. This is, what we, this is an example that we have in, in, in Torah and in scriptures, one that was from a certain people, the Ethiopian eunuch. He didn't go to Rome. He didn't go to England. He, well, I'm not going to say he never visited Rome or England. I don't know. But we know that his place, he was going to Ethiopia. He was going to speak to his people. Hey, w wonderful thing. You know, um, um, I don't think he would say, guess what? But let me tell you, you know, <laughs> You know what I, you know what I have received. You know what I mean. And that we know something like that must have occurred because Africa, the Horn of Africa, and Nubia, which is southern Sudan, today so persecuted, our persecuted um, Christian and Nubian people, black people in in, in in Sudan across the border, in Ethiopia, and other parts of Africa, all along the coast. There was the Coptics all along North Africa before those peel and red white Arabs came and destroyed the church and all the Romans and everything like that. All that whole region was African, black, Hebrews, Jews, and even, well, later on, Mohammedans came into the picture, many of them black people, black Arabs, so forth and so on. But even in that earlier time, you understand, there were many black Hebrews and Christians in that whole region right there. This is the half of the story right here. But on a point of tithe, for the first word in the law that speaks on that, it says, all the tithe of the land, of the land. Now, for one to take the tithe of the land and then say that your, your, your income, you know, in other words, your income and stuff like that is land. That's interesting, since most people probably don't have any land, and most of these people who they're tithing to, notice what happens. They get a piece of land. You understand? They own a piece of land. You know, they land, they get a boat, they get air. They, they are claiming the earth as their own and telling you lies, basically. So for I and I people, and in this society, no tithe. In other words, till the promised land. Those who want to give free will offerings or gifts, and if in their own heart they say, well, no tithes, because there's a couple of brothers and sisters and some who have sent it under so-called tithes and others who have been like, I would like to tithe, so forth and so on. And we never command that, but we know that tithes is in the Scripture, and for us as black Hebrews, as Hebrews, as Israelites, as Ethiopian Hebrews and Rastafari, according to the new name, we know that's a part of it, but we also know that it's connected with the land. And what we want to do is to share this with ones and ones so they recognize that, first of all, tithing was commanded to Israel. You understand? It was commanded to the so called Jew. You understand? Or the Hebrew. You understand? Not to the Gentiles. Um, tithing. You know what I'm saying? Only appears when Christ is talking to the Hebrews and when either Paul or another wrote the epistle to the Hebrews. And tithing in practice, 
You understand? Know was only in a sense um, uh, reverse engineered. Now I can't say resurrected. No, they reverse engineered like Frankenstein monster in a sense. They took pieces here and there and they put it together. It's alive. You understand? Know That's the Romans. The Romans did that 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 one that one right fear, the Roman Catholic Church. So it's very interesting how this kind of would come down to us through like England, the Protestant Church, and then with these um um niggas, apes, alligators, coons and possums, right? You know, and imposters here. All right. This is a very good uh uh D V D right here and we highly recommend it. So my brothers and sisters, on that point of time and I'm sure we're gonna going to touch on that, you know, a little bit more in detail, but the main thing is, as one purposes it in their heart, in fact, I had a couple of verses I want to close out on this, and, um, you know, um, share this, remember what Christ said, Christ said, teach them, you understand, to observe all the things that I have shown you and taught you. So if we start teaching things that the Moshiach, that Jesus Christus has not, can we really call ourselves faithful witnesses, faithful ministers of his word, of his good news, the glorious gospel? No, we cannot. You understand? And one's money or pimping or whatever like that ain't going to really help you. So he, he tells us, you know, that one who loves him, if we truly say, I love God, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Yeshua, and we have to keep his commandments. And he say, well, his commandments is only to love. No, no, a lot of other things he said what to do. Wherever, he, wherever Christ tells us what to do, that's a command. You, you see what I'm saying? He don't have to do no bells and whistles and say, oh, no, it's a command. It's a charge. You do this. It's not saying, well, if you want to, if you like to, then keep my commandments. You know, it, it was keep my commandments if you love me. That's the test right there. And see, that's a test for each of us individually. That's how we can test even ourselves, that we say we do love him, but then we maybe allow certain things or certain things are still in our nature that we have to give up. You understand that we have to give up to him. We have to come to him in prayer, ask him for strength and wisdom and overcoming with these things because it's not like we save ourselves, so to speak. You understand? It's his spirit mingling with our spirit that saves us, but it's not really of ourselves. You understand? But it's the Father and the Son through our obedience and receptivity to his word. You understand? Both in our head, but really when the seed goes deep and reaches our heart, that those real life changing, you understand? And life prospering, life fulfilling experience where you could just you wake up. It's a, it's a, it's a, the world is still rotten and evil. You understand? But, but, but you are confident in Christ. You understand? And you're going to have a good day and a prosperous day. You understand? That's what he said. You see all sort of things. He said rejoice. He said don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. So people say, well, I just can't. I know he said that, but you just can't help yourself. You don't love him. He didn't say, he didn't say if you love me a little bit, keep my commandment a little bit. If you love me a lot, then keep it. No, you don't. he said if you love me, keep my commandments, period. There's no high or low, whatnot. This is this the word. So, um, second, um, second Corinthians. I think it's second Corinthians. I want to speak to just briefly for a moment. Second Corinthians. I hope I took this down correctly. Second Corinthians, chapter, chapter um, nine. Right, chapter nine. Um, the main verse is verse seven, but we'll we'll hopefully we'll have enough time in this to 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 get to that verse. Second Corinthians chapter nine, the Samar Will Memphis Caduce Hadram Lak, named Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the one God, the true God, God and Father of our Black Lord said Jesus Christos. For as touching the ministering, the ministering, there's a little P there. And it gives another reference, but ministering is also the administration to the saints. When you see the word saints, that is Kedusan. In fact, this Torah portion is speaking of the Nazarite vow. And the Nazarite vow says when a man or woman shall separate themselves, that's the process, keeping the Sabbath, keeping it separate and apart 
from all the other things that you be doing in the week, you give John that one-seventh. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like you're tithing, in a sense, that one-seventh of your time, you know what I'm saying, to him, your mind, your spirit, your, your body, to him. And you're strengthening, and you're being blessed. In fact, you're more blessed than that than following these so-called prosperity preachers. At least you learn the word. You'll know, you know, you'll know, you'll be able to discern spirits, you know what I'm saying, who is really preaching this word and who is giving me a song and a dance. For as touching the ministering of the saints, or the Kedu son, the holy ones, it is superfluous for me to write to you. He's saying to the Corinthians that it is... It, it would be a waste of time for me to write to you about administering to the saints. In other words, there were those people in those communities who were, who were kedusan, who, who were set apart. They were the saints, the holy ones. They had, they had um, given their life to the service of God in, in, in a real powerful way. And the local churches were to, the congregation was to minister to those ones. Because if you had a problem, if you had a question, they, they were those people who would, who, would, who would give themselves to God and his word. So if you needed something, they'll be right there, you understand, in that sense. They were, they were the saints of the community, you understand. And there was real spiritual power, I want to say this too, that there was something like AIDS going on in those times among those type of people. They would have the power to pray, to pray and, and, and God would give it to them because they already showed their true love and, and faith by how they were living, claiming to be of Christ or in Christ as compared to these excuse makers that we get today. Well, nobody's perfect, but my Bible says, be ye perfect. you saying nobody's perfect. Someone, someone is right and someone is wrong. You understand that either you're right and the Bible's wrong or the Bible is right and they're wrong. So when you hear this nobody's perfect crap, you understand? Many people are not perfect. Many of us in the birth wrong are not perfect. But the whole birth right and being born again is a process of perfecting ourselves. But it's according to our obedience. It's all really within our will. Are we going to make our wills obedient to good influences or not? And that's, that's the road to perfection right there. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of, uh, boast of you to them in Macedonia. They say Macedonia, but really uh, Macedonia, like Macadamian nuts, not Macedonian nuts. Well, that Achaia, Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked very many. Because they were so zealous, they had they had umph for this ministry of the King of Kings and His Christ. Well, in their time before the revelation, of course, but still they had that zeal. You understand that zeal, or you can almost say like it's like it's like an expression of righteousness. Because when you know you're rightly aligned, you're in a right relationship. It does much for your confidence, your sense of your sense of being that no pharmaceuticals are lying you know, lying um, liars can do anything to, to bring you off of that. They had, a, they had a zeal, and that zeal provoked many. Yet have I sent the brethren, yet have I sent the brethren, least our boasting of you should be in vain on this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. So I sent brethren to you so you would be ready. I sent ones to you to prepare and to help you to be ready. So he's ministering to each of these local communities and churches and congregations of folks who, who met in their houses. They didn't go off and, and make some big mega church or something like that. That would have been foreign mind because that's a fringe, a Gentile um, aberration. You understand? This is why the church age is coming to that, that ending point as we're going into the kingdom age now. You understand? As Israel is coming home. Least happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not, ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. In other words, because we've been telling so many ones that you're ready, you're ready, yo, these brothers, these sisters, oh, this community here, these brothers, I mean, they're ready, but I want to make sure that you're ready. At least I'm going to send other ones and ones to you. You understand? And he says, we. 
So, in other words, he's taking the responsibility that even if they're not ready, it's going to be my fault because I really didn't do all of my power to, to see that to see to it that you were ready. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're trying to bring this particular message about tithing to you all so that one's, w w your mind will be ready on this. You, you'll, you'll go take notes and, and study it, find it for yourself, and then you'll be clear on this. So you won't have to have this question about well, who's right or who's wrong. You'll see the evidence for yourself, right? He says, therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort, that means build up the brethren, the brotherhood, that they would go before to you. So I want to build up the brotherhood so, so that they will go before. Before I come, the, the brothers will come to you. And make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. In other words, are, are there funds for, for, for the next level of this ministry that we're about? So I'm sending ones and ones to secure to secure those things. But it's he says right here, it's of bounty, it's of barricade, it's of blessedness. This is it's not of covetousness. Because he's here he's talking about funds. Or we could say monies in that sense, the preparation, because to do these things and to feed so many people, that's what church was. It was a feeding. It's like amongst us is a Rastafari in that sense of Aital and Aital um, um, food and when we, uh, the traditional old, I would say, sense of Rastafari. We ate. I remember going to brethren's homes and brethren would come over to my home. He might bring a couple of oranges. He, he, might, he might bring a couple of apples, some water, you know, some like spring water, you know, and some, of course, ice, some lamb's bread, and we'll sit down, might have some bread or some food or whatever. We share that. And once came to one's homes as Rastafari and visited each other, they brought food. And I began to notice that that, that trod or tradition, that righteous tradition, began to go away. I mean, sometimes one of the ones will come and visit you and don't bring in even Aishans. And they'll probably have some Aishans, but they don't bring any Aishans. Or they'll be like, oh, can I smoke? Go right now like that. And you'll be like, you, you brought anything? I just brought this little something. Come on, man. You know, and then maybe now they only brought that little bit because times are difficult. But probably times are getting difficult because when one's had, they were stingy and they were selfish. But saying, oh, I love you. You got anything to eat? Why don't you get some water, bring some, some, I mean, what that cost, a dollar and something? Come on. You know what I mean? Um, this, this, this is real talk. Some people don't like this, but I guess we know what spirit they are. You understand? The encouragement, God loves a cheerful giver. If we give, he will give. Now, of course, you know, they take this verse, and they don't want you to really study it for yourself. They, they, they want to put you onto some, some, some emotional thing. You know, to, to give you a kind of emotional thing and guilty conscience and, you know, other kind of games. This bit kind of breaks down some of, much of that. But this I say, he that soweth, notice the language, he that soweth, they say, sow a seed into this ministry. A seed? They took the verbal hieroglyphic example of sowing a single seed, and they've been able to flip. Wow, that is deep. You understand? That is, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. You know what he's saying, brothers and sisters? He is saying, and here when he says the bounty, he's now using this agricultural. Remember, he's an Israelite. Paul is an Israelite. He tells you already. He says, well, what more do we have as Israelites? He says everything. He talks about the laws, the covenants, and so forth and so on. And he never throws those things away as, as Gentile Christians will make you believe that he does. He doesn't if you study it for yourself. He's saying right here that he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now, what they try to tell you is that this is your, quote, tithe. But have you noticed the key missing element? What's the missing element here? If you read this whole chapter, you won't find it. What's the missing element? The missing element is tithe. They'll make you think that, see, sowing, because then they'll take you to, 
to the Old Testament, especially to Leviticus or the, their favorite Malachi. They'll take you there and they'll say, see, this is, see the connection right here? The land and seed and now you give some money and it's like putting it in the land and you get something back to pay your bail. I mean, bail, I mean, bell, I mean, bill. You understand? Which is it? It's all of the above, right? But it's clear that what he was saying here, he's using, he's saying, if you, 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 you all, all are agriculturalists. You all know that. If we have our promised land and have our piece of land, right, we get our portion of land and we're going to, you know, um, grow crops on it. And if you put two or three seeds, right, right here, you know, you're going to reap maybe one or maybe two, maybe nothing. You understand? And if you put ten over here, you might reap seven or five or so. But if you properly put your put the put the furrows, you know, the furrows, the rows in. Don't have no wiggly wiggly thing, but, but I'm gonna keep it straight so that the water can go deep, the seed can go deep, it can be nourished and it can grow. You're gonna get much more out of it. So it's saying if you put out a couple of seeds, you you're gonna have to expect even less crops back. But if you put out more seed, you know, because there's a whole fractal sacred geometry too, you're saying the more you put out, the more you're going to get. You know, we're saying he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. He said, every man according as he purposed in his heart. Notice what, what Paul didn't say. Paul didn't say, um, everybody's going to have to give a tithe. Whatever they make, count a 10% and give that to me. He, he didn't do that. He said, every man according as he purposed in his heart. If he said, I'm going to 